Hello Booktube, and I'm here with a Clifford D. Simak video. It's one that I've been asked for for quite a while. It's my top 10 uh, novels of Clifford Simak. Since he wrote just under 30, um, even, you'd think that would be an easy task. Well, it's not. Um, and a lot of these that I, I've, I haven't read or reread in probably 25 uh, years or so. So I'm going from memory, which isn't always the best thing. And these could change uh, as I go through my reread next year. A couple will never change. I know that because I have reread them more recently. And they're not going to be sort of 10 to 1 and 1 the best. Well, or is it? it? I'm going to be doing it from newest to oldest. And the and again, like it's, it's of ones that I have here. There, there's a few that could be honorable mentions, which I don't have. Actually, um, they, I realize that I don't actually have a copy of a couple. But we'll just won't worry about those at the moment. The newest one is 1981 Project Pope. This is a cool cover with all the glare on it. Yeah, that's even worse. Uh, and this is the British edition hardcover by uh, Sedgwick and Jackson. And it's got a nice cover on the back, or the back cover as well. Well, what is Project Pope, you ask? On the rim planet fittingly called End of Nothing, a bizarre society of robots and humans toiled for a thousand years to perfect a religion that would create a new and all-embracing faith. That's all you need to know. I really, really enjoyed this uh, when I, I've read it twice, but a long time ago. So, that was a good one. The next one, well, it's going to be a mix here of some hardcovers and some are mostly paperbacks. Now, this one was published in 1978. A Heritage of Stars. Thousands of years in the future, Thomas Cushing is haunted by the history of his ancestors. His quest is to regain humanity's lost heritage, and he sets out to find the fabled place of going to the stars, from which ancient technological man left Earth to travel among the alien civilizations of the galaxy. As he travels, he gathers about him a selection of weird and wonderful beings, a group of stalking shadows, Meg, the hilltop witch, and a shivering ghost-like snake. Along with Rolo, the last surviving robot, Cushing and his companions embark on an exciting and wonder-filled adventure of the far future. A Heritage of Stars, 1978. 1976. Shakespeare's Planet. Kind of a nifty cover on this one. It is a Sedgwick and Jackson British edition, uh, as I say, 1976. Now, after a thousand years in space, the Earth vessel lands on a remote planet capable of supporting human life. Inside the explorer ship, an almost inaudible hum fills the silence. Computer lights blink softly, signaling the awakening of the cryogenetically preserved crew but only one crew member awakens from his artificial sleep a systems malfunction has killed the others carter horton is alone horton learns almost immediately that the planet is inhabited by a bizarre creature who calls himself carnivore and the creature addresses him in english the language he had learned from an earlier traveler who called himself shakespeare Shakespeare is dead, and Horton soon learns that he and Carnivore too face certain peril unless they can get away from the strange planet. Leaving is no simple affair. Carnivore 
and before him Shakespeare, had come to the planet via an inner space tunnel. <coughs> Excuse me. One of many such tunnels that exist throughout the galaxy. But this tunnel has broken down and works only one way, the wrong way. And Horton's explorer ship is a thousand years obsolete, incapable of returning them to civilization. The creature called Carnival and the Earthman Horton are marooned on a planet of mysterious ruins, bespeaking a ca catastrophic end to a once grand civilization. The portentous, the portentous signs they begin to encounter imitate that intimate that some dire ominous happening will soon befall them unless they can repair their inner space tunnel and leave Shakespeare's planet. Okay, now, I haven't been numbering, so that was 10, 9, 8, 7. And... Number seven was published in 1974. Uh, that could have been uh, in the magazine. 74, 75. Our Children's Children. Some of these you may have already seen in other forms. On a summer's day, like any other, holes open in the air and people walk through them into our world. They kept coming and kept coming until they numbered in millions. They said they came from the future. They were our children's children. The holes were time tunnels. Time tunnels. One-way passages from the future. And down them were fleeing our after generations, escaping from an invasion of intelligent yet murderously savage aliens. The tunnels were supposedly secure and guarded. The beasts, whatever they were, couldn't get through. Or so it was claimed. But then somebody up ahead slipped up and the beasts were abroad. Number six was published in 1971. Destiny Doll. The planet beckoned them from space and closed around them like a Venus flytrap. Assailed by strange perils and even stranger temptations, the little group stumbled towards its destiny. Mike Ross, the pilot, Sarah Foster, the big game hunter, blind George Smith, and the odious Friar Tuck. Before them was a legend made flesh. Around them were creatures of myth and mystery. Close behind them stalked Nemesis, the doll. The little wooden painted doll was to be their salvation or their damnation, for each might choose and find his own nirvana. Great stuff. Uh, number five? Yeah, I think this is number five. Yeah, number five. Published 1968. The Goblin Reservation. In those days, interstellar teletransmission had been perfected, and at the same period time travel had been mastered. All creatures, real and legendary, were now free to roam the galaxy. Professor Peter Maxwell left Earth on his own special mission, but some sort of cosmic error landed him on an unknown crystal planet, which turned out to be a storehouse of secret knowledge. When Maxwell returned to Earth, filled with the necessity of alerting anyone uh, to his treasure, of alerting everyone to his treasure planet. He found to his astonishment that nobody would listen, for it seemed that he himself had returned from space a month before with no such story and had since then been accidentally killed. No one any longer believed that the original Peter Maxwell really existed. And Fritz Leiber says the finest novel in a merry mood that Simak has yet given us. It was a fun story. Number four. Published 1967. Yes. 
it, well, this is a book club edition. I'm not the greatest of jacket, but the, then the original first edition wasn't the greatest of jackets either. Uh, the werewolf principle. And there's no blurb on this, so it's from memory you have to take. Uh, an astronaut returns to Earth, has amnesia, but uh, he finds out that he's got two other beings in him. And under stress, or for whatever, for other reasons, he will turn into a werewolf. Uh, or, uh, at other times, he'll turn into a pyramid structure. There you go. <laughs> uh, I, I, I remember enjoying it very, very much. Um, and again, I don't, I don't remember too many details about it. Uh, and that's why I want, well, that's one of the reasons why I want to do a reread through uh, with these. But it, it's, it's always held an impression in my mind of, of, of one of his... Uh, enjoyable ones that I really liked. Okay, now we're going back in time here. Uh, this is 1967 as well, so I don't think that's quite right. But I think this is predates the werewolf principle. Why call them back from heaven? What price is too great for immortality? Forever center towers above... The above everything on earth in every sense in this mighty five mile high block all the hopes and desperate dreams of humanity are focused forever center's aim is to put an end to death fueled by most of the earth's riches it has more power than any government more control than any police force and millions of people endure drab poverty in order to pay for eventual immortality there are those who say it is wicked or misguided there are those who whisper it is corrupt, but only one person knows the true secret of Forever Center, and she has disappeared. Now, one I, I one is still packed away, and I don't have a copy here. And I can show you the the uh, copy that I actually have. It's a hardcover. It, I also got a uh, corresponding city as well. This is Way Station, published 1963, and it's basically about um, an old. Well, he's not that old. Well, he's old, but not old. I uh, should say, Civil War veteran, and he's been contacted by aliens, and to turn his farmhouse into a way station where it's uh, on a highway through the stars where beings are teleported in and then they have to wait a little while and then they teleport out to their own uh, locations and Enoch Wallace is the veteran and as long as he stays within the walls of his house or in the caverns below that have been uh, excavated for him to live and all the equipment he doesn't age but he does go out every day um, to get his mail, and he takes little walks with his gun uh, through through the land nearby. And there had been a a uh, mishap with uh, at at one time with one of the aliens dying. He buried it uh, on on his property, buried the alien. And there are rumors going around, and he's being looked at. But there is other things afoot and it's a really really good story and apparently it has been bought uh, by Netflix and Netflix are going to be making a film about it or a production or it's a production company that is it will be placing it on Netflix um, I know nothing more than that and it, they, they're calling it a thriller, which does not work in my mind, but there you have it. Now, the number one book, and it's because of the date, honestly, is City. A fix-up novel that was published in 1952. It is a collection of short stories that, well, let's just see what it, what it says on the back here. On a far future Earth, mankind's achievements are immense. Artificially 
intelligent robots, genetically uplifted animals, interplanetary travel, genetic modification of the human form itself. But nothing comes without a cost. Humanity is tired. Its vigor all but gone. As the human race dwindles and declines, which of its great creations will inherit the earth and which will claim the stars? Say a pretty good write up of it, and it has to me a wonderful um, sort of editor's preface because you see, these are short stories that have been edited in the far, far future as tales. And the editor is the editors and the readers of all these are dogs, the genetically uplifted animals or one of them that is talked about on the back. And this is the editor's preface. These are the stories that dogs tell when the fires burn high and the wind is from the north. Then each family circle gathers at the hearthstone and the pups sit silently and listen. And when the story's done, they'll ask many questions. What is man? They'll ask. Or perhaps, what is a city? Or, what is a war? I come back to City, well, I've had a gap of probably about seven or eight years, but I, I used to read it at least once a year, and one of the stories, Huddling Place, more than that. It's the second tale. And this, this version, uh, which is the SF Masterworks, has the final epilogue story that... Uh, Cliff Simak wrote for a John W. Campbell memorial album in 19... I was going to say 1973, but I don't see a date here. Uh, maybe there's a date in the front uh, with it. Uh, 1973! Yes! See? The noggin works occasionally. So yeah, City is number one. There, only, only by... Uh, uh, the, the, you know, by date. It's the earliest one. Yeah. On my list here. So, yeah. So, there's my ten Clifford Simak novels. And, as I say, they could change over time as I reread all his, all his works next year, well, in the year following. But, this will give a good guide, I think, if anybody wants to dip their toe in Simak country and yeah so that's it I'll see you next time booktube